Welcome to Lady Killers, a podcast about female serial killers. I am your host, Abraham Archambo. Let's go dig up some bodies. Hello everybody out there, greetings and welcome to Lady Killers. I'm your host, Abraham Archambo, and I would just have to say it feels pretty pretty goddamn good to be back doing a full episode of Lady Killers today, and uh, you know, I've, I've missed all of you, and I just really look forward to jumping right into it here. I hope everyone is doing well as we trudge along towards our uncertain future as this terrifying coronavirus continues to rage across our nation. I hope that you are all staying as healthy as you can be out there and doing your part to help quell this virus that has already claimed over 130,000 of us just in this country alone and is looking to take down many, many more if something isn't done to stop it. But I digress. You all know this isn't a podcast on health and science. That's not why you're here. You're here to listen to a podcast, a true crime podcast about female killers. So without further ado, if you are all ready, let's find out who this week's lady killer is. For this week, I've decided to finally tackle one of the biggest states in our nation, which is the Golden State of California. Now this, it was kind of a difficult decision because there's so many prolific female killers that did their horrid deeds in the state of California. One of the most famous killing sprees of all took place in the state during the summer of 1969. And I'm sure very many of you out there that are listening right now have heard of the Manson family. And even some of you young people out there uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Manson family. They were pretty famous back in the 60s, and I think if you hear the name Charles Manson, you instantly know who he is. I mean, Quentin Tarantino just did a movie on this. But uh, this is going to be about one of the female killers from that clan who participated in those murders that happened between August 8th and August 10th out on Cielo Drive in Benedict Canyon back in 1969. I had to narrow it down to just one of the women to discuss this week. Uh, For me, it was kind of an easy choice uh, because the murder of Sharon Tate and her unborn baby still sticks with me to this day. And it just, uh, it made me recall as a young boy when I used to spend a lot of time with my grandparents, specifically my grandmother, uh, I remember one particular exciting summer day where I found myself reading Helter Skelter, which is the book that discusses the the Manson family murders. Uh, So there I was at my grandmother's house reading Helter Skelter. I was probably third grade, maybe. And unbeknownst to anyone in my family at the time, I was reading Helter Skelter. And uh, the reason I found Helter Skelter was my grandmother had this bookshelf in the corner of her living room. And there it housed many, many books from all different genres, uh, from classic literature up to the top-selling books, modern-day books. And, you know, I learned a lot by reading some of the old classics. That's where I was introduced to, you know, Hemingway and, and stuff like that. But the one book that really stood out to me was Helter Skelter. So there I was you know, minding my own business in the corner with with my books, like I always was at my grandma's house. And I was checking out all the titles, and I glimpsed one. It was called Helter Skelter. And being a naive little dummy, I was thinking it was going to be about the Beatles. And so I snatched it off the shelf, and boy, was I surprised, shocked, and pretty traumatized for a while. That is the book that actually set me on a lifelong path of studying serial killers and true crime. 
It also introduced me to the sadistic cult leader Charles Manson and his merry band of brainwashed dunces. One of these dunces stood out in my mind and it never really has left. I mean, there were those with those quirky nicknames like Squeaky, Cinderella, or Snake, but I was interested in the one that was nicknamed after a character in a Beatles song. So you must be thinking now, that's the second Beatles reference that I've made in probably less than a minute, and I think you now know that I'm a huge Beatles fan, and at that time, the White Album was one of my favorite albums, and there was a character from the White Album, So yes, Squeaky From was nutty. She flashed her crazy, insane eyes at the camera, trying to show everybody how how loopy she was. And I remember even as a child that she scared me just enough to keep me on my toes. And she made me fearful that she would hunt me down somehow and do what she did to those poor, innocent people. But, uh, you know, I didn't want the obvious choices, some of those, those names that you hear in the news all the time surrounding the Manson family. I wanted to dig a little deeper and find out more about this specific woman. Uh, I was really enthralled by her because she's the one that took full credit for the stabbing of an innocent eight-month pregnant starlet, Sharon Tate. And so I wanted to dig deeper and find out more about that weak-minded woman and what could lead her to commit one of the most heinous crimes in California history. So, this week's Lady Killer is the repulsive, ruthless murderer, Susan Atkins, otherwise known as Sexy Sadie. Susan Atkins was born on May 7, 1948, to a middle-class family in San Gabriel, California. Her parents, Edward John and Jeanette, were both reputed to be raging alcoholics, which seems to be a familiar trait among the parents of our lady killers that we've discussed over the weeks. Later on in Atkins' life, she would claim that she was molested by an adult family member, uh, which is also another unfortunate act that seems to plague many of our lady killers, the abuse as a child. For the first 13 years of her life, she lived around the San Jose area. She was known to be a quiet girl who mostly kept to herself. She was always up in her head, kind of in her own world, thinking her own thoughts. And uh, But she did have a good voice, apparently, a singing voice. And she sang in the Glee Club and the local church choir. And then around the age of 15 in 1963, Susan's mother uh, found out she had cancer. And so Susan, which you wouldn't think after the, the crimes you're about to hear, you wouldn't think she would do this. But she did gather a bunch of the uh, choir members that she used to sing with and gathered them under her mother's hospital room window and they would sing Christmas carols and some church songs just to kind of ease her mother's pain. So at one point in her life, she did have a heart, it sounds like. Her mother finally did die from cancer not long after that, which left Susan with just her father, Edward, and her little brother, Stephen. So her father, Edward, couldn't find work where they were staying, and took the tribe down to live in the L.A. area. Not too long after arriving in L.A., Edward found work on the San Luis Dam project, and he basically left his children behind to go work on the dam to make money, and this left Susan all alone with her little brother Stephen, so she had to take care of him. She had to figure out how to make ends meet, so at that time she was just a junior in high school, She had to get a job to take care of her and her brother and also try and focus on her schoolwork. It appears at this time also they had to bounce around between various family members in the area while Susan was working and trying to make her way through high school. Uh, This is possibly where she was molested by one of the adults that she spoke of that was in her family. it didn't say for sure in, on any of the uh, the research I did, but uh, I would say it's probably probably something that did happen at that time. Susan was just a mediocre student, so she just really couldn't cut it anymore and decided to drop out of high school. She moved to the San Francisco area and immediately fell in with a band of crooks and some ex-cons. She dabbled in some robberies 
and other petty crimes to make ends meet. Uh, she also tried her hand at some topless dancing for extra cash. And uh, somehow she had made her way up to Oregon. Uh, and that is where she actually did her first jail time uh, for some petty crimes. She uh, did some time in the pokey up there. And then slowly, I guess, got sick of it in Oregon and made her way back down south where she would eventually meet Charles Manson in one of the homes that she was squatting in. When she first met him, he was jamming on his guitar, and according to one of the interviews I read with her, she just instantly fell into a trance. In her own words, she said she was, quote, hypnotized by Manson as he strummed away on his guitar and crooned a love song to her. Later on, Susan also claimed to she believed she was in the presence of Jesus when she was around Manson. Uh, it was also known at that first meeting between her and Manson, she was uh, pretty high on acid at the time. So, uh, I mean, I, I dabbled with that in high school as well, and I did see Jesus too. So, and I don't know. I never did see Manson. So, who knows what Susan's talking about here. But uh, somehow they made a connection through his unbelievably awesome music and his guitar playing abilities. And uh, so much so that according to Manson... Just after he was done playing that song, they uh, kind of disappeared to go uh, go upstairs to, to make love. One of the homes that Susan was staying in at the time was eventually raided by the cops shortly after her introduction to Jesus Christ, and this left Susan homeless. Charles Manson found out about this, and so he offered her a place to live, which was not a house. It was actually a converted school bus. And he told her that uh, he was going to take a bunch of free spirits and just travel around the country on a road trip. He knew she needed a place to stay, so he invited her along on the trip. And Susan, being homeless and helpless, agreed to the journey across the nation in a black bus. This is where Atkins would meet the likes of Lynette Squeaky Frome, Patricia Krenwinkle, and Mary Bruner. Now Manson... He gave all of his followers a nickname, and he started calling Susan Atkins by the name Sadie Mae Glutz. The reason he did this, he said, is to kill any ego of any of these women that were being brought into the family. He needed to kill their ego off, so he renamed them, which is something that cult leaders do. But he invited her into the fold, and they embarked on a year and a half road trip of self-discovery. They really didn't have an aim in mind, I don't think, or a destination. I think they were just uh, intending to travel around the entire country. Sadly, though, they only made it as far as the Spawn Ranch in the San Fernando Valley. The following year, on October 7th, 1968, Sadie gave birth to a son. Uh, it was not Charles Manson's son. It was uh, one of the many other guys that Sadie was with. But Manson kind of took control of it, and he gave the baby a new name. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I'm going to give it a go here. He named him uh, Zizo Zizose Zadfrak Glutz. Pardon me if I didn't pronounce that name correctly, but uh, I mean, the name doesn't really matter much anyway, since it was changed shortly after when the boy was given up for adoption anyway. Susan had to give the, the boy up for adoption after she was convicted of the murders we're about to, uh, to find out about here. She only spent about a year with the baby, and uh, she really, after she went into prison, she never really had contact with him ever again. I think it would be, it'd be kind of cool to, I didn't really do research to see if anybody knew who that, that boy ended up being, but uh, it'd be interesting to, to find out what happened to him. At the Spawn Ranch, Charles Manson began his work on the warping of the minds of all of his followers. They participated in acid trip after acid trip, epic orgies, and they even got to sit in on Manson as he lectured and spewed his insane vitriol about the impending race war. And this is the race war that he liked to call Helter Skelter. In the summer of 1969, the Spawn Ranch, where Manson and his cult followers were squatting, was being closely watched by the local authorities. Apparently there had been just a load of car thefts 
And they were all being attributed to the Manson cult, so authorities were keeping an eye on them. And then once they started watching the Spawn Ranch, they started to become highly suspicious of the amount of runaways that seemed to frequent the ranch. A lot of young girls were hanging around the ranch, and this was uh, throwing up some red flags for the police in the area. And I think Manson, he must have sensed that the authorities were onto him, because that's when he started making plans to leave Spawn Ranch. Uh, apparently he wanted to head further out into the desert and kind of practice what they were doing without any intervention from authorities. Kind of reminds me of the, the David Koresh cult in Waco in the compound they lived, you know, just to kind of stockpile your, your weapons and just kind of be separate from society. And that's what Manson wanted to do out in the desert. But in order to do that, he was going to need a lot more money and they had none coming in. So he convinced a lot of his followers to, to get into the drug trade, I guess you would call it. And uh, that would, you know, help pay some of the, the moving expenses for the family. So during a botched drug deal, one of the central cult members by the name of Charles Watson, he went by the, the nickname Tex, which we will learn a little bit more about in a second here. Uh, he, conv he convinced Manson to shoot one of the, the buyers that was there for to pick up some drugs. His name was Bernard Crow. He went by the name Lots of Papa. But he was shot by Manson, who intended to kill him. So he shot him. They left Crow bleeding there, uh, presumably dead. And only later did they learn that Crow had survived this assault. And this is the point in the Manson family timeline that uh, Manson really began to ramp up his fears of this helter-skelter, this impending race war among the human race. Uh, he believed that Bernard Crow, the man that he shot, was a member of the Black Panthers. And since he survived the shooting, Manson thought for sure that Crow was going to be returning to the Spawn Ranch and finish off the Manson family one by one with all his other Black Panther buddies. So with Manson fearing this retaliation, he really started to ramp up his exit strategy from Spawn Ranch, and he urged his cult members to start throwing cash his way immediately. And he told them they better start coming up with some ways to get some money because, you know, they, they needed it, and they needed it now. And there was an old friend of the family by the name of Gary Hinman who was purported to have just inherited a large chunk of change, and Manson thought he would be the perfect target to fix this cash flow problem that they had run into. Manson was planning on convincing Hinman to join their cult, and then slowly he was just going to bleed him dry of all this newfound inheritance. It was also, at one point, Manson said Hinman had sold them some bad mescaline, and so he kind of had a, he had a beef with Hinman, so so Manson, he had no problem sending out his minions to go knock on Hinman's door and uh, start start sniffing around a bit at his house. So Manson sent Sexy Sadie, along with two other members of the cult by the names of Bobby Beausoleil and Mary Brunner. On July 25th, 1969, they went to Gary Hinman's house, and they were going to try to extort the money from him. After Susan Atkins' trial later on, she claimed she had no idea that, that anything vicious was going to happen at Hinman's home. She was told just to go there and get money and get out. But then later on in 1977, she released a book that she had written. And she stated she knew they were going to pick up money, but she also she knew Gary Hinman was in trouble and that he would possibly lose his life during the transaction. So it's hard to really hard to gauge where Susan Atkins was at at any moment because she really flip-flopped a lot and so she's not really a reliable source at times but at any rate once they reached Hinman's house Bobby Beausoleil confronted him about this new inheritance he supposedly had come across and Hinman insisted this was not true and that he didn't have any money at all and so Bobby proceeded to beat him senselessly after he was done with the beating, he again prodded Gary Hinman about his money, but to no avail. He still claimed he had no money. He had no idea where they even came up with that idea. And so 
it was time to call in the big guns. So old Charlie Manson showed up with a samurai sword for some reason and began to question Gary Hinman about this so-called inheritance he had come into. But Hinman still stood by his original statement that he had no money. So that little guy Manson swung at Hinman with his samurai sword, leaving a gash across his face and severing one of his ears. Right after this, Manson stormed out of the residence and he left Sadie and Mary Brunner behind to tend to his wounds. This is the first violent act that Sadie was a part of, all under the orders of Charles Manson. Over the next three days, Sadie and Mary stitched up Hinman's face with dental floss and then tortured him again and again until Bobby Beausoleil finally persuaded Hinman to sign over the registrations of all his vehicles to him. And after Hinman had signed over the vehicles and they promised they were going to leave, Beausoleil stabbed Hinman twice in the chest. As he collapsed to the floor, Sexy Sadie and Mary Brunner took turns holding a pillow over his face until he eventually died. They all fled the scene, but before they left, Bobby Beausoleil left behind some revolutionary type prose. In Gary Hinman's blood, he wrote the words, Political Piggy. And the reason he wrote Political Piggy is he thought that that phrase would most likely implicate the Black Panthers in this murder, and authorities would head that direction, and they would, wouldn't would even pay attention to those cult members at Spawn Ranch. Unfortunately, Beausoleil also left behind a bloody handprint, and that is a handprint that would lead to his arrest on August 7th of 1969. Bobby Beausoleil was found sleeping in one of Gary Hinman's vehicles on the side of the road. He was still covered in the bloody clothes he was wearing on the same day that he killed Hinman two weeks prior. However you look at this case with Gary Hinman, you know, whether Susan Atkins really knew what they were going to do to Hinman once they got there, it doesn't matter. She participated in the torture and she held the pillow over his face he actually died with the pillow over his face. So, you know, Susan Atkins murdered this devout Buddhist who was also, he was actual ally and a friend of the Manson family. So it shows Susan Atkins had just no remorse. She would commit violent acts on anybody. It didn't matter. Whatever Charles Manson told her to do, she was good to go. So this takes us to the evening of August 8th, 1969. This is where Charles Manson ordered his sheep to go to some of the rich folks' residences up in the hills and steal their money. He was uh, pretty bitter at this time. Uh, he thought he was moving to L.A. to be some uh, big rock star. He thought that everybody would just welcome him in. and His music sucked. His songwriting was terrible. And he was basically, basically shunned and not allowed to, to get into the music business in L.A., and this really, really started to build this huge chip on his shoulder, and he just he couldn't let it go. So, this is where he decided to send out his minions to the rich folks' homes as he thought about them. And they were to kill them after they got everything they went there for. He assigned Linda Kasabian, Patricia Krenwinkel, and of course our new maniac, Sexy Sadie. They were all to ride along with Tex Watson and follow his orders, as he was the leader while Charles Manson, that little coward, he stayed safely behind at Spawn Ranch. That evening, Tex Watson and his three minions slaughtered five people in a mansion in Benedict Canyon. Now the mansion that they came across just happened to be the home of a very famous director by the name of Roman Polanski, and it was also the home of his very pregnant wife, the Hollywood starlet Sharon Tate. Polanski was away in Europe, finishing up a, a film he was directing at the time, so he was not around during the attacks, but since Sharon Tate was going to be alone while he was out of town, she invited friends over to have a little cocktail party, but that was winding down and they were getting ready for bed, and some of them were already in bed trying to sleep when these uh, cult members showed up. There was Jay Sebring and Abigail Folger, who was there with her husband, I believe it's pronounced Wojciech Frykowski. 
And uh, they were in the home. But the first person to actually come into contact with the Manson family was an 18-year-old kid named Stephen Parent. He was next door at the guest house visiting one of his friends. And upon leaving, he was leaving the gate, out the gate in his car. That's when he encountered the cult members. And he was trying to drive away through the gate while Tex Watson was driving through the gate. They both kind of had a little interaction and Tex Watson just blasted him with his gun. Right after that, Tex escorted Sexy Sadie and Patricia Cranwinkle up to the main doors of the mansion. So while they were inside preparing for bed, uh, finishing up their cocktails, they were bombarded with the evil Manson family cult. Jay Sebring, who was a Hollywood hairdresser and a very close friend to Sharon Tate, was shot and stabbed multiple times until he died. Uh, the other couple I had mentioned, Frykowski and his wife, Abigail Folger, who was the coffee heiress, actually bolted from the house and almost managed to escape before Tex Watson and Patricia Cranwinkle engaged a pursuit after them. This left Susan Atkins all alone with the beautifully talented Sharon Tate. So while Tex and Patricia were chasing down their victims uh, and slaughtering them out on the front lawn, Sexy Sadie was having a moment with her new plaything, Sharon Tate. Tate pleaded for her baby's life before her own life. And after some of the interviews I had read with Sexy Sadie, uh, it was said that she asked, that Sharon Tate asked her child to be born first before anything happened. She said, please just let my baby be, bo be born and then you could do whatever you want, but please do not harm this child. Because Sharon Tate knew that her baby was to be born at any moment in the upcoming days. And she just she was begging for Sadie to spare her life. So upon hearing this tidbit of information, Susan Atkins, a.k.a. Sexy Sadie, lunged forward with a knife, plunging it deep into Sharon Tate's belly. So basically what she wanted to do was kill the baby first, which is exactly opposite of what Tate was pleading for. Uh, so she got the baby out of the way first, in her mind. Um, and then Sadie commenced slashing and stabbing Sharon Tate to death as she begged for her life. And a little side note here, actually. The sexy Sadie, she didn't kill the baby with those, those stabs. The baby actually, according to the coroner's, and the medical examiners, they said that the baby actually suffocated because uh, Sharon Tate, you know, stopped breathing, which in turn caused the baby to stop breathing as well. So the baby actually lived a little bit longer than Sharon Tate did. It could have been saved, actually. Didn't have to die, but, uh, you know, that's how Sadie is. That's who we're dealing with. I mean, those are the kind of people that were involved in this Manson family. So once Sadie was sure that Sharon Tate was dead, Tex Watson instructed her to write something that would, quote, shock the world on the walls or somewhere they wanted to write it. So Susan Atkins, a.k.a. Sexy Sadie, soaked a towel in Sharon Tate's blood and, and then used it to paint the word pig across the front of the door. And then later on when they found Sharon Tate, she was a... Uh, almost hung by the rafters by a rope that was connected around her neck. And then that rope went over the rafter and connected to the neck of Jay Sebring, the hairdresser, who lay butchered on the ground. Basically, they were linked together by these nooses almost and just completely butchered. So, needless to say, Sexy Sadie had graduated into the big time. So these... Cult leaders that just committed this horrible, horrible, horrific act headed back to Spawn Ranch to the disappointment of their leader, Charles Manson. He apparently thought it was way too messy what they had done up on Cielo Drive, and he told them he would need to take them out the following night to, quote, show them how it's done. So this coward of a little tiny man who didn't even accompany the cult members to the mansion to kill these people. The one who was telling them to do this says they didn't do it right. They were too messy and he'll need to show them the next day how to do it. Like he's like, he's God, like he's 
better than better than them at murder. Like it's it's just ridiculous the, the mindset here. So on August tenth, nineteen sixty nine, the crew headed out into the night, and they settled on a neighborhood in northeast Los Angeles, and came across a house that seemed to fit what Manson was looking for. It ended up being a home of uh, two grocery store owners by the name of Leno and Rosemary LaBianca. Manson and Tex Watson entered the home first and tied the couple up at gunpoint. And this whole time, the, the LaBiancas were very cooperative because they were told it was just simply a robbery. And if they listened and cooperated and did everything they told them to do, they would just rob them and they would, you know be on their way and let them go once the ordeal was over. So Manson, of course, this goddamn coward that he was, he returned to the car and sent back in a woman, Patricia Krenwinkel, and another Leslie Von Houten, back in to finish the job that he couldn't do because he's a coward. And the cult leader, again, left Tex Watson in charge, and he headed back. He took the only car they had and headed back to Spawn Ranch. Charles Manson did. And he instructed them to, you know, finish up the job. And then told them to hitchhike back to the ranch. So not only did he, didn't even have the balls to to commit these horrible acts. He made these women do it. More of this, just bullshit is what it was. And then he took the only remaining getaway car for them and told them to hitchhike back. How they fell for this bullshit, I do not even, I don't understand. But they did. He had a hold of their brains, you know, and that's what brainwashing is all about. So those two girls, Patricia and Leslie, that were in there, they were supposed to murder the two innocent victims and then leave more of this bullshit, nonsensical word painted in blood. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, Susan Atkins, she claimed she was outside during the onslaught, that she wasn't even in there. And, uh... She said she had no involvement whatsoever, but she also, at one point I saw, she said she didn't remember. So, I don't know if we really know if Sadie was in there killing anybody, but uh, she was another accomplice to another horrible crime. So now we have the city of Los Angeles just in a total panic. The authorities believe that the Tate murders were drug-related, and that they didn't see any way that they could be connected to the La Bianca murders. Uh, so, but they did their investigating, and uh, while the the cult members just basically laid low at the Spawn Ranch until October, when the authorities moved in on Spawn Ranch and uh, started arresting people for stolen vehicles. That's they had no idea that that they were involved in murder. They just thought they were stealing cars and possibly doing something weird with some some young girls out there. And, and uh, many of the cult members were arrested at that time, and one of them was our very own lady killer, Sexy Sadie. She was actually arrested uh, and charged for the murder of Gary Hinman, which is something she probably thought she had gotten away with long before. But And it was one of her fellow cult friends who actually turned her in, you know, pointed the finger at her to try to detract from the car thefts. And uh, so with what little evidence the police had and this finger pointing going on from one of the other cult members... Now Sadie was in a heap of shit compared to all those others that were accused of stealing cars. So while while Sadie was incarcerated, uh, she just couldn't shut up. She turned on her motor mouth and she thought it was time to just double down. She started blabbing about more than just Grand Theft Auto. And she claimed she was, you know, only tortured Gary Hinman. She, she said she might have been involved in some, some car thefts and a little torture. But uh, that's not what some of her cellmates said, because uh, they immediately went to the authorities, and they told them all about Susan Atkins' boasting, and apparently she claimed she was the one that killed Sharon Tate. Not only did she kill her, but she told some of the other inmates that she tasted Sharon Tate's blood. So now we can add cannibalism and even possibly vampirism to the growing list of Sexy Sadie's hobbies. And by the end of 1969, all of the cult members that were involved in the killing spree in August had been arrested. So Susan Atkins stood before a grand jury, and she was actually a witness for the prosecution initially, because she had agreed to testify if they took the death penalty off of the table. And 
they told her numerous times that she was not being given immunity in any way and that she could po possibly implicate herself in these murders if she didn't watch out. But she took it all in stride and she accepted the terms of this agreement. She was actually quoted as saying, quote, I understand this and my life doesn't mean that much to me, end quote. Uh, you know, maybe she was done trying to impress her God, Charles Manson, I don't know. But it seems as though she was finally giving up and she was kind of accepting some sort of responsibility for her actions because she really, really started to, to spill everything. I mean, I read a, one of the interviews that she did in December of that year and she really went into detail of everything that she did. And, uh, of course, later on she would recant this and then, and then she would readmit to doing it. And like I say, she was not that consistent with, uh, with her storytelling. But the testimony she did have was extremely graphic. And she went into specific details on how all the murders went down in front of the grand jury. Uh, and during the grand jury testimony, she admitted to stabbing Frykowski in the legs. And then she went into a very, very detailed and graphic account of her assault on Sharon Tate. Uh, which I briefly touched on, but... Uh, if you really, really want to get into the specifics of it, uh, there's some good interviews online you can find with Sexy Sadie where she really goes into detail. I just didn't want to, I don't know, I didn't feel like going too into detail of all the, the things. I, I feel like I've given you enough disgusting details on the Sharon Tate murder, but uh, it's out there if you want to uh, to go further with this. But she testified at that time in front of the grand jury, she testified that she had only held down Sharon Tate and that Tex Watson was the one that stabbed her. And Sexy Sadie claimed that after Tate had begged for her and her unborn baby's life, that she yelled back to her, quote, woman, I have no mercy for you, end quote. And I think that that line just clearly solidified her fate. Um, just It showed that she had absolutely no care for human life. But later on, I mean, she would end up denying that when she said, woman, I have no mercy for you, she said she was talking to herself. You know, she was high on acid and she was in a, basically on a different planet. And she had this internal monologue that just was continually going on and she just blurted that out. She said she was talking to herself. She wasn't talking to Sharon Tate. She didn't tell her she had no mercy for her, she said, but, I mean, can you really believe her after what she's done and, and how many times she changed her story? I mean, it, it's really hard to believe her. After the testimony, Sadie denied much of what she had said. Uh, she took responsibility for stabbing Sharon Tate, stating that Tex wasn't even involved at all. And then she also denied having tasted Tate's blood. She said it was just something she said at the time. Um, I'm guessing she was trying to appear like some sort of badass when she was initially locked up for the Hinman murder. Uh, so that she was claiming to drink blood and who knows what was going through her head. But, uh, she just basically started denying any involvement in the Tate LaBianca murders and she stopped cooperating with the prosecution, which put the death penalty back on the table, which is what they warned her. And when she was asked later why she did this, she claimed that she was in fear of Charles Manson because she thought if she testified against him, it would put herself and her son in great danger. And she claimed that Manson had sent other cult members to let her know that uh, it would be very unwise to testify against him. And of course, Manson, uh, the little coward, again, used others to do his dirty work for him. And then, basically, Susan Atkins reverted back to taking no responsibility for her actions in fear of her life because Charles Manson. The trial of the Manson family women began in June of 1970. Again, Susan Atkins flip-flopped and she admitted to stabbing Sharon Tate, which was something she had trouble admitting to because at times she would accuse Tex Watson of the stabbings, other times she would admit to it. Um... I'm convinced that Sexy Sadie was the perpetrator. I just think she, the reason she flip-flopped, she just, I don't think she can fully wrap her mind around what she did and the guilt that she had 
that's why she would try to, to push the blame onto Tex at some times. And then sometimes she would uh, be lucid and she would pop back into reality and, it, and, you know, admit to it and take responsibility for it. And, uh, you know, she said something on the stand that really stood out to me. And it seemed genuine in, in my humble opinion. Because she said the reason she stabbed Sharon Tate was because she was, quote, sick of listening to her pleading and begging, begging and pleading, end quote. I mean, that doesn't seem like something you, you would make up. She just blurted it out saying she stabbed her because she wouldn't shut up, basically, is what, what it sounded like. And according to those that were close to the trial, not much was given, not much credibility was given to her testimony anyway. Um, because she was clearly contradicting herself every single time she opened her mouth. So it was really hard to to take her word for it, you know. Um, not only did she contradict her own testimony, she was even contradicting facts that were already known to the case. Like she was changing the facts that were already out there. So she just she couldn't wrap her head around it. And when she was asked why she would be all over the board like that, she claimed she was just doing what Manson told him to do on the stand. He basically told them to take full responsibility for the murders and just tell them he never told them to do anything. Sadie claimed that he told them they would have to, quote, get on the stand and claim we had deliberately and remorselessly and with no direction from him at all committed all the murders ourselves, end quote. So even locked up and on trial, the girls were still under Manson's control. And as Sexy Sadie and her fellow cult pals were led to the courtroom, they would sing songs that Manson, the failed musician, had written. So they were still trying to impress the cult leader, knowing that accepting full responsibility would lead them to death. They didn't even care. I'm not fooled, though, because I think Susan Atkins was 100% present during those murders. Uh, she had some pretty specific details about how it all went down. And she never showed remorse for the killings, and she even bragged in jail to whoever would listen. Of course, her story changed when she was faced with the death penalty. But uh, in my eyes, she's a killer, plain and simple. On March 29th, 1971, all four of the defendants on trial were sentenced to death. Sexy Sadie was headed to death row. And not even for the crime that got her locked up in the first place. You all may have forgotten about poor old Gary Hinman. Uh, he was the reason she was arrested in the first place. But, you know, after the trial for the Tate LaBianca murders, people had forgotten about that. But they also convicted her for the murder of Gary Hinman. And she pled guilty to all the charges against her in that particular case. Uh, and, of course, even though she pled guilty, she denied, she still denied knowing they were going to kill him during the robbery. She said it was just supposed to be robbery or simple extortion and uh that was it but of course years later she would contradict herself again when that autobiography came out in 1977 uh among many other outrageous claims out there if you want to get a hold of that book and read it susan atkins death sentence was commuted to life in prison following a supreme court ruling in 1972 that invalidated any death sentences that were imposed prior to 1972 and hers was in 1971, so it would just be life in prison for her. And like I said, while she was on death row, Sexy Sadie wrote her autobiography. And it was titled Child of Satan, Child of God. Someone actually published it. So if you want to see a little bit deeper into her mind, you should check that out. Uh, in the account, she discusses her time spent with the Manson family, uh, her various prison experiences, and her eventual conversion to Christianity, which happened in 1974. And she claims that from 1974 on, she was a devout Christian. She said one time she witnessed Jesus sitting in her cell with her, not Charles Manson, the, the other Jesus. He was sitting in the cell with her, and uh, she said from that point on she was sold. She saw Jesus, and uh, I guess this version of Jesus replaced the original version of Charles Manson that she had had back in the late 60s when she had first met the cult leader. Um, she said that she was a helpful Christian behind bars. Uh, she taught other people about the glories of God. Um, and it was said that she also helped in emergency situations uh, 
inside the jail, one of which was an attempted suicide. Um, so she wanted people to think, you know, little sexy Sadie went from sadistic evil murderer to Mother Teresa in no time. But again, I'm not fooled. While Susan Atkins rotted away in her prison cell, she somehow still managed to get married twice. In 1981, she married Donald Lee Lazier. And a funny fact here is Sadie would be his 35th wife. And of course, the two divorced not long after the nuptials, when Donald decided he was already ready to go claim his 36th wife. And then in 1987, Sadie married a Harvard Law grad who was 15 years younger than her by the name of James Whitehouse. And he would go on to represent her in her parole hearings in the years 2000 and 2005. Uh, and that would have been her 17th attempt at parole. But at that hearing, she was denied for another three years. At this point, Susan Atkins was already close to death due to the fact that she had a brain tumor that was eating away inside her head. Her attorney claimed she was paralyzed on one side of her body, she could barely talk, and she needed assistance even to sit up in bed. So they were arguing for a compassionate release from prison. Unfortunately for Sexy Sadie, members of the Tate and Sebring families were in attendance at the hearing and implored the parole board to deny her request. They were pleased when Sadie was denied for another four years. 2008, it was revealed that Susan Atkins was in fact dying from brain cancer and she had been wasting away in a hospital bed. One leg had been amputated in the process. This did not garner sympathy from the prosecuting attorneys in her case. She claimed, or they claimed she was bleeding the system of nearly $1.5 million to take care of her while she was in the hospital. And she was also allowed to marry twice and have frequent conjugal visits while, while Sharon Tate and all the other victims of those fateful nights in 1969 lie prematurely in their graves. Although Sadie claimed to be a reborn Christian, she never ever showed remorse for the murders she committed. And even at the time, Governor Schwarzenegger of California, he also opposed Atkins' release, stating he didn't believe in compassionate releases from prison, especially considering the severity of her crimes. The nephew of Jay Sebring, Anthony DiMaria, he said it best, I think, when he said, quote, You will hear various opinions with respect to this today, but you will hear nothing from the nine people who lie in their graves and suffered horrendous deaths at the hands of Susan Atkins. End quote. All 11 board members denied her parole. So all in all, Susan Atkins was denied parole 13 times since her initial parole board hearing in 1976, all the way up until 2009. And then on September 24, 2009, Susan Sexy Sadie Atkins died in prison from natural causes. Her husband, James Whitehouse, claimed she was paralyzed over 85% of her body at the time. Uh, but it sounds pretty fitting for a maniac like uh, Susan Atkins. I mean, I know sometimes in our justice system, bad people are allowed to walk and commit atrocities yet again. But thankfully, in this case, with sexy Sadie Atkins, she never had the opportunity. And over all the time that she did in prison, uh, it was said she really never did feel remorse. She claimed she was a good person, she loved God, she followed his word, but she still never felt bad for what she did. She slaughtered innocent people. One of them was an unborn child who was just days away from breathing its first breath. For what? To impress a tiny failed musician who didn't even have the balls to do anything himself. He preyed on naive, lost little girls that had daddy issues. I mean, Susan Atkins was prime candidate for Manson's grooming. I mean, she looked every which way for someone to take care of her and nurture her since she really never had that as a child. I mean, it just it just goes to show how important it is as parents to be there for your kids. Yes, I mean, I know her mother passed away when she was just entering her teenage years, which I think are the most formative years for a young girl. When she needed a parent to turn to after the tragic loss of her mother, uh... Her one remaining parent fled and left her to fend for herself. I mean, I know she had good deep inside of her being because it makes me think back to when she brought that church choir to sing for her dying mother. I mean, she had compassion. She truly loved her mother. 
But unfortunately for Susan Atkins, she would always feel abandoned and she would always seek out a, approval. This is why she went to jail early on up in Oregon trying to impress some guys up there. You know, she just she wanted attention and she really needed a father to show her the way. Unfortunately, Manson was all she could come up with. He knew he could brainwash and, you know, this compromised little girl. And uh, he knew he could get Sadie to do his bidding. He, he plied all his cult followers with psychedelic drugs and he just he took advantage of all of them. And uh, it just it makes me think back to that that interview I mentioned back in December of 1969 with Sadie. Uh, Atkins said that during that first sexual encounter with the cult leader Charles Manson, he told her to envision she was having sex with her father. I mean, Charlie knew how to get into her mind just from the get-go, just like that, you know. And Susan Atkins just never had a chance in that situation. Um, you know, she would always seek out approval from a male and it wow Charles Manson being being the one to step into that position is probably not what she had expected and it's what would eventually ruin her and that is the story of Susan Atkins aka Sexy Sadie well folks remember uh, send in any comments or questions you might have to the email address for this podcast which is the Lady Killers Pod at gmail.com. Uh, I'm going to put that in the notes for this episode as well. Uh, that is the Lady Killers Pod, P O D, at gmail.com. Uh, let me know how we're doing and if, uh, if there's any killers you would like me to discuss in an upcoming episode. Uh, you can also check out our production website at 1129productions.com for updates. Uh, I will also leave a link for that in the notes for the podcast. Uh, You know, if you feel so inclined to contribute to the podcast, uh, you can also do that in the link that will be provided for you. Obviously, it's not a requirement to donate, especially during these trying times, but I want everyone to know how much it is appreciated when you do, you know, contribute to this podcast. Regardless, this podcast will remain free for your enjoyment. Uh, Whether anyone contributes or not, it doesn't matter. It's still going to be free for you, so don't worry about that. And last but not least, my screenplay, Loon Lake, is available on Amazon as a paperback or an electronic read. Uh, Go check it out, you know, and uh, if you want to see what all the hype's about. I can't promise you you won't have nightmares, but, uh, you know, I think you should check it out. I'm, I'm pretty damn proud of it, proud of that screenplay, and I fully intend to keep marching forward and get this film made as soon as we feel it's safe to do so. Well, that's it, folks. Uh, I want you all to know I am hopeful that we will beat this virus that's ravaging our planet. I know we have it all inside of us. Just be kind to one another. There's no place in our society for hate. Go check on a neighbor. You know, make sure they have what they need emotionally and physically. Just take care of each other. Stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands, and wear a mask when you go outside. I am your humble and grateful host, Abraham Archambo. I hope you have sweet dreams.